Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to the February 2023 CTSS Quiz. I hope everybody's doing well. Those of you on the East Coast, I hope you're surviving a cold winter. And those of you in Florida, I hope you're surviving a very nice winter. And everywhere else, from the East Coast to the West Coast, to Europe, to Africa, to Australia, New Zealand, China, Russia, wherever you are, We'd like to say hello to all of our friends. Anyway, with that, no more messing around. I have 10 cases for you. Let's see how well you do answering 10 interesting cases. In this patient with bone marrow biopsy for suspected myeloma, what's the best diagnosis? If you look at the images on the axial view, you see what looks like a large soft tissue mass in the retroperitoneum, particularly tracking on the right side, greater than left side. You can see from the sagittal view, it tracks all the way down to the patient's pelvis. You can look at the bone. There are multiple mixed lytic and blastic lesions, most consistent with the diagnosis of myeloma. So what is this? Well, it's a soft tissue mass of relatively high density. It doesn't have the consistency of adenopathy. It's not nodes and it's not lymphoma. You can think about a sarcoma, retroperitoneal sarcoma, but again, it's so homogeneous. I told you the patient had a biopsy. It looks like the patient has myeloma. And this is a really nice example of a large retroperitoneal bleed post-biopsy. In this patient with suspected GI bleed, the best diagnosis is? Well, four choices. Well, you know I'm not going to show you a normal study. The patient has probably some diverticular disease, but nothing very impressive. And it's surely not an indeterminate study. If you look at the descending colon mid-portion, you see a few diverticuli, but you also see high-density contrast in the lumen. This is a classic example of a GI bleed. Remember, we do arterial and venous phase imaging. Often the bleed will change extent between arterial and venous, most of the time becoming more bright in venous. When that happens, the chance of an angio being positive for therapy is very likely. But this was a nice example of a GI bleed involving the descending colon due to diverticular disease, a really classic case. The least likely cause of the liver lesion in this patient is, well, if you look carefully at the axials and coronals, what you see is a mass in the right lobe of the liver which bled. There's a subcapsular collection. So what things bleed? The one I classically always think about is hepatic adenoma. And right up there with that is hepatoma. So that's a good possibility. We rarely see hemangiomas bleed, except if they're biopsied, occasionally with trauma. But in the literature, there are reports of hemangiomas bleeding. Liver cysts, even large cysts, never. Never is a big word, but never bleed. So this is not a hemangioma. This is not a hepatic adenoma as a diagnosis or hepatoma. Those are all possibilities. The least likely cause would be a liver cyst. The most likely diagnosis for this incidental pancreatic mass is, well, what am I looking at? I'm looking at a one centimeter mass posterior body of pancreas near body tail junction. Now, schwannomas, I've seen a few lately, but they're usually low density, well-defined, not vascular, so that's not good. It could be an accessory spleen, but it really looks like on the imaging that it's part of the patient's pancreas. Remember, accessory spleens are closer to the tail. This is in the body. And when you look at the epicenter, it's really a pancreatic mass. It's not a, a great fooler like an accessory spleen. It could be metastatic renal cell, but that would be mean on my part because I'm showing you two normal kidneys. So the best answer, hypervascular mass in the pancreas, and we are picking up smaller and smaller lesions all the time, would be that of a neuroendocrine tumor. So just a beautiful example of a neuroendocrine tumor. This was biopsy proven. It was not resected because of its size. Most people these days at one centimeter peanuts will simply follow. The most likely diagnosis for the bilateral adrenal masses in this patient is, well, you can see there are bilateral masses that are fat attenuation. Now they do have, the one on the right has calcification, but the fat density, adenomas measure up to minus 10 perhaps, 
This would measure minus 70. Mets, even from liposarcoma, are not going to be fatty tumors. Hemorrhage is high density. This is a classic example of bilateral adrenal myelolipomas. Myelolipomas are usually unilateral, but they can be bilateral, and this was a nice example. Myelolipomas can calcify. More commonly, they're punctate calcifications, but at times the calcifications can be more extensive. The lesion in the right ventricle is most likely. If you look at these two images, arterial and venous phase, there's a mass in the right ventricle in the wall. And typically that's going to be a tumor. Now you can argue primary versus metastatic. 40 times more likely is metastasis than a primary tumor. You also can see there are liver lesions present. So what are we thinking about? This is not going to be a thrombus. Yes, occasionally you can get thrombi in the right ventricle, often in patients with catheters, but this is the wrong position, and this is in the wall. It's not just an intraluminal thrombus. Angiosarcomas do occur on the right side, right atrium more likely than right ventricle, but that would be a thought, but liver mets would be uncommon. It's not a myocardial infarction. What it is and what it was is a metastasis to the heart. Metastasis to the heart can occur from many things, from melanoma to lymphoma, from lung cancer to renal cell. This was metastatic liposarcoma to the heart and the liver. You can't really make the diagnosis of liposarcoma unless I would have given you the entire retroperitoneum, which I didn't do. But again, when you see this appearance, you got to be thinking about metastasis, and that was the answer. The most likely diagnosis of this incidental splenic lesion is, well, what do I see? I see a well-defined splenic lesion that outpouches the borders of the spleen. Fairly homogeneous, minimal enhancement, very sharply marginated on the axial arterial phase imaging and the cinematic imaging. Angiosarcomas of the spleen are rare, but they're very vascular and irregular. This is not an angiosarc. Hemangiomas can be big, usually they're small, but they're typically vascular, and they're typically irregular in terms of vasculature. The truth is, I can't really exclude a hemangioma, but it's less likely than the right diagnosis. This is not a splenic abscess. Abscesses are typically low density, but irregular, not so homogeneous. This border, this outpouching, is more classic for a splenic hamartoma. So the most likely diagnosis is splenic hamartoma, I give you a quarter point credit if you said splenic hemangioma. The most likely diagnosis in this case is, I showed you this case because I want to make several points. The most common reason people miss pancreatic cancer is because they see a dilated pancreatic duct but don't recognize the significance. This is a beautiful example of a dilated pancreatic duct with atrophy of the distal body and tail of the pancreas and a subtle hypodense mass in the body. Yes, there's pancreatic atrophy here. No, this is not the appearance of chronic pancreatitis. And pancreatic lymphoma gives a bulky pancreatic gland with diffuse infiltration. This is the classic example of a subtle pancreatic adenocarcinoma obstructing the pancreatic duct and causing atrophy. This patient would be resectable. Remember, the most common reason people miss pancreatic cancer early they don't give significance to a dilated pancreatic duct. If you see a dilated pancreatic duct and no mass, I'm still suspicious there's a mass present. I would recommend further studies, and typically EUS would be done next. The most likely diagnosis in this case, well, what are you seeing? On the study done with positive oral contrast, you see multiple filling defects in the stomach. And the truth is, these are gastric polyps. They're not pseudo-lesions because of the way they look on the coronal view. Yes, you can get fooled sometimes if patients ate different foods to look like a filling defect, but then it's more like a mass, not so many discrete lesions. I guess blood clots a consideration, but the way it interacts with the wall of the stomach makes that unlikely. So multiple polyps in the stomach, you got to think about juvenile polyposis syndrome, Many things, many of the polyposa syndromes, Canada Cronkite, juvenile polyposis syndrome, Gardner syndrome, can all give gastric polyps. 
in addition to small bowel polyps. So this was one of those cases, just a very nice example. The best diagnosis in this case, the key finding here on both the axial and sagittal views is a large filling defect in the left atrial appendage. What you recognize here is the atrial appendage is large and the defect is a fluid fluid level. Now, of course, what you're worrying about is a thrombus. Atrial myxomas occur more commonly in the left atrium than right, but typically not in the uh, appendage of the atrium. But also a fluid fluid level tells you something that this is flow related. If it was a thrombus in the left atrial appendage, it would not be a fluid fluid level. This is not the appearance of myocardial ischemia or infarction. It's not the appearance of myxoma. It's a pseudoclot. If you asked me if you weren't sure and you were fumfering around, what could you do? Just get delayed scans. There was an article published a while back that showed if you waited an extra 60 seconds, the left atrial appendage would be isodense to contrast. So anyway, great example of a pseudothrombus. Don't make that mistake. Most of the time, it's not as dramatic as this case, but it's something you don't want to mistake. Okay. Now with that, we've done 10 terrific cases. I hope you got them all right. As always, we make the point, the goal of the quiz is not getting them all right. It'd be great if you did, but it's learning. So hopefully you've learned something. Hopefully the quiz will help you in practice. And hopefully we had a great day together and a great time together. And with that, see you in March. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.